At one point, environmentalism was about saving wild places and wild beings, but there's been a transformation take place. It, the, the evolution of the transformation goes back longer, but, but really over the last 30 years, there's been acceleration of this transformation toward being about not protecting wild places and wild beings, but instead about sustaining this destructive culture a little bit longer. And so there are a lot of leaders of the modern environmental movement who will say explicitly that they're, they're trying to save civilization. They're not trying to save the oceans. They're not trying to save the forests, the, the grasslands, the, the deserts. And that is a project that is doomed in any case because first it's it's this way of life it's civilization itself that is destroying the planet and second this way of life civilization can never be sustainable and so a they're trying to do something that is not possible you can't consume a planet and live on it too and b insofar as they succeed they're actually harming the planet. You know, if, if we turn this around a little bit, um, you know, all of my work could be summed up by saying that this way of life won't last forever. And when it's done, I would prefer that there is more of the world less. This way of life won't last forever. And when it's done, I would prefer that there is more of the world left rather than less. Yeah. What? What, do you, what are the modern environmental movement's priorities at this point? Figuring out ways to power this society. Sorry, I mean, can, you, can you restate the question? Oh, sure, sorry. Um, so the, the, sort of the, the goals of a lot of the modern environmental movement are to find ways to power or fuel this destructive way of living a little bit longer. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying that that's true for all environmentalists. I'm not even saying that's true for the majority of environmentalists. That's just what the majority of environmentalism ends up doing, though. Um, there's, there's a couple of things about that. One is that even when I started being a grassroots environmentalist back in the early '90s, I so many of the other activists I knew were basically hanging on by their fingernails trying to protect this or that piece of ground until civilization would crash because they recognized that, like David Brower said, all of our victories are temporary and all of our losses are permanent because the timber, the, the timber industry and the Forest Service can put out a timber sale and we stop it this year, but then they come back next year and put it out again. And they put it out again and they put it out again and eventually they're going to they're going to succeed in getting it through and getting the the forest destroyed and it struck me back then that the making it so just a few more generations of lynx and bobcat and salamanders live out harried lives before ultimately they're exterminated, that's, that's not good enough. And another way to look at this is Robert J. Lifton wrote this great book called The Nazi Doctors. And in this book he asked how it was that men who had taken the Hippocratic, and they were all men in this case, um, who had taken the Hippocratic Oath could do something as heinous as work in a, in a death camp. And what he found was that I mean, there were some exceptions like Mengele who were just sadists and horrible, horrible human beings. What he found is that a lot of the doctors who worked in the death camps would do everything they could to actually help the inmates, to help the, the Jews and other inmates. They would hide them from the selection officers who were going to kill them. They would um, feed them an extra scrap of potato. They would get them a day off work so they could rest just a tiny bit. And they would do everything they could except for the most important thing of all, which is they wouldn't question the existence of the death camp itself. 
and they wouldn't question working the inmates to death, they wouldn't prisoners to death, they wouldn't question poisoning them to death, they wouldn't question starving them to death, and I immediately saw how that fits in with even the best of us as environmentalists is that we do everything we can to protect this or that species we love except for the most important thing of all, which is to question this entire culture that is working the planet to death, that is starving the planet to death, that is poisoning the planet to death. And so it just seemed very clear to me that, switch subjects, that it seemed very clear to me that as a doctor friend of mine says, um, proper diagnosis is the first step toward correct treatment. And if you have, if you think that the problem is just too much greed or the problem is this particular timber sale, sure you can still do really good work. Just as many of the Nazi doctors in the, in the Nuremberg trials after the, the, the war, there were Jewish people who testified in defense of some of these doctors because they said, yes, he was horrible, he never should have been there, he never should have been working there in the first place, but he saved my life. And there are scraps of land that are being saved. You know, before we turned the tape on, you were telling me about um, a, some deforestation going up on up in Alaska and how, you know, they had cut a several thousand acre clear cut, but environmentalists were celebrating because they were able to protect the mountaintop. And that, in my mind, in my mind, that's just such a great example of the best and worst of modern environmentalism, is there are people who are really fighting very hard to save that mountaintop, and then what about the rest? I mean, this is, every, every place needs to be protected, so I don't want to diminish the efforts of those who protected the mountaintop, but, but, I mean, it's like Schindler's List, you know, that you can save a few, but there's still this larger holocaust going on. Again, not to diminish the efforts to save the few, but to say that by any realistic estimate, they are grossly insufficient. So, you said the proper, di the proper, the proper diagnosis is the first step. What would be the diagnosis? I know that's a really broad question. No, 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 no. It's 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 in many ways the question. Um, so, what is the proper diagnosis for the destruction of the planet? There's a bunch of levels at which we can look at that. One of them is that when you think of Iraq. Is the first thing you think of cedar forests so thick that sunlight never reaches the ground? That's what it was prior to the beginnings of this culture. The first written myth and the second religious text of Western society is Gilgamesh deforesting the hills and valleys of Iraq to build a great city. And when you think of the Arabian Peninsula, it's the first thing you think of Oak Savannah. That's what it was prior to the beginnings of this culture. And those were cut for cash crops for export. Uh, the Near East was heavily forested. We all hear about the Cedars of Lebanon, and they still have one on their flag. Um, North Africa was heavily forested. North African forests went down to make the Egyptian and Phoenician navies. Um, I never can remember, I think it was Plato, one of those ancient dead Greek guys uh, complained how deforestation was harming water quality in ancient Greece and how there were former streams that were now gone because deforestation had caused sedimentation. And I have no doubt that the ancient Greek Department of Environmental Quality said we need to study this for a few years and make sure there's actually a correlation. Um, Italy was heavily forested. I got a note a couple years ago from somebody who lives in, on some island in the Mediterranean who said that she was shocked when she found out that those islands are not supposed to be rocky. 
that they were actually heavily forested before they were all cut. And the rocks that are so famous for those islands uh, were where they're supposed to be, which is underground. And the point is that, I'll wait till they go by. I was doing an interview one time and there were people at the next, it was like over there where there's tables near each other and I couldn't believe it. People saw that we were doing an interview, you know, we had the whole get up and then they sat down right next to us and started talking really loud. I was like, what the hell? Anyway, um, so they say that one sign of intelligence is the ability to recognize patterns, you know, let's let's lay out this pattern and see if we can recognize it in less than 6,000 years. It's just, it's crazy to me that people don't see the pattern, you know? Do you know why there aren't any penguins in the Northern Hemisphere? There are no penguins in the Northern Hemisphere because they were wiped out. They weren't penguins, they were called great auks, A-U-K-S. And there were so many that um, even on just one island, one of the French explorers said that you could load every ship in France and it wouldn't make a dent. Well, they did, and it did, and the last one was killed in the 19th century. And there were flocks of passenger pigeons so large they darkened the sky for days at a time, and they're gone. And just south of here, down at the Klamath, um, Klamath is the second biggest river in the United States on the West Coast, after the Columbia. And even as late as the 1930s, the uh, the Klamath was black and roiling with fish. And the last couple years, the, the Indians on the Klamath have had to cancel their salmon ceremonies because there aren't enough fish left. And that's only been 90 years. And the Talawa and the Yurok lived here for at least 12,500 years without destroying the place. This culture arrived less than 200 ago and the place is pretty trashed. And we can say this for everywhere. We can say this for Iowa, for God's sake. Um, Iowa was, oh wait. Actually, are you picking this up? Yeah. It's better. Okay. It's not, it's not loud, but it's, sort of exclamation point on your comment. <laughs> Seems like regular cars are okay. It's those ones with the... It's the diesels. I think that they're manufactured to sound like that. It's... <laughs> Americans love loud things. Yeah. You know the Dyson vacuum cleaner? Yeah. The original one that was sold in Europe was quite, 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 very quiet. But they had to change the design for the American market. It's crazy. Because Americans don't oh. think it's powerful if it isn't. If it's quiet, it's not actually doing anything. Yeah. Yep. God, there's a metaphor there for politics too, isn't there? <laughs> um, okay, Iowa. Oh, yeah. So, Iowa, I mean, which is basically cornfields at this point, was one of the most rich and diverse places in the country in terms of wildlife. It was called, quote, a country so full of game. Um, and this is what, it's predictable. You know, there have been a number of civilizations around the planet and every one has lasted somewhere between a couple hundred and this one a couple thousand years. And they've, it's completely predictable that they all collapse, and one of the reasons they collapse is because they destroy the soil. And it frustrates me that more people don't see this fairly obvious analysis that if you're going to live sustainably in a place, sustainability means being able to, a thing is sustainable when you can do it more or less forever. It's, seems like a fairly good definition to me. And if you are harming the land base, 
you can't do it forever. So it seems to me, well, let's back up. How do we think that the world got to be so wild and rich and fecund in the first place? It got to be so full of life in the first place by everyone living and dying and improving their habitat. We always hear that, that evolution is based on survival of the, the fittest, which has been sort of converted to mean survival of the strongest, most sociopathic, most best able to exploit. And it is true that if you have two bears fighting over one scrap of food, the strongest one will be able to push the other one away. But that's only part of it. Because the way you survive in the long run is by surviving in the long run. And you don't survive in the long run by hyper-exploiting your surroundings. You survive in the long run by actually improving your habitat. That's how you exist. It's not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the fit. How well you fit into your land base. How well you are able to improve the health of the land base. I hate to use sort of a wage language, but it's kind of like a natural community will uh, advertise for who will do this job, who will, who will, or maybe it's for a role, but that's too, well, I don't like acting either. So they will, we'll, we'll go with the language for now, they'll audition for uh, who can move nutrients from the ocean into the forest. Who can do that the best? Who can help the forest the best that way? And I'm sort of getting off topic, but the, the real point is that if you harm your land base, your way of life won't be sustainable. If you have uncannable salmon, and then you can count them, and then you have a million, and then you have a half a million, and then you have a quarter million, and then you have a hundred thousand, then you have fifty thousand. Anybody who is not the head of the National Marine Fisheries Services can understand where that is going to end. And where that ends is with no salmon. And so really all I've done with my work is look at patterns. And the pattern is that civilizations rise, they destroy their land base, and they fall. I, I, I sometimes get interviewed, I, I, and I got interviewed like this a little while ago, maybe a month ago, with these people getting really mad at me because I kept saying that this way of life can't last, and they were saying, well, we don't want to give up on, they literally said, we don't want to give up on our golf courses, and we don't want to give up on all of these wonderful things that, that are brought to us, and I said, that's fine. I mean, I like hot showers too, but we're not talking about what we want. We're talking about what's possible. And an industrial system is not possible. It's not, well, it's possible, obviously, but a sustainable industrial system is not possible. And at some point, we have to be, as James Howard Kunstler said, reality-based adults. And it's not all about what I want. It's what about, it's about what the world affords. I mean, it's like, think about this in, in a family. You have a family who has, and I hate talking about it in terms of savings, but I think it works. You have a family that has, doesn't matter, $100,000 in savings, or a million dollars in savings, ten, it doesn't matter. You have some amount in savings, and then you're spending more every year than, than your, your income, and at some point, Dad says, gosh, son, I don't think we can spend quite this much this month. And son says, tough luck, I want a new car. I mean, eventually, you're going to run out. And I keep saying I don't understand why more people don't see that, but actually I kind of do. And part of the reason for this is 
There's a great line by Upton Sinclair, it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. Or we can make this both sex neutral and uh, applicable to the larger circumstances. It's hard to make a person understand something. It's hard to make people understand something when their entitlement depends on them not understanding it. So what do you think is wrong with, I guess, what, what, are, what are the, I guess, so this brings us back to modern environmentalism. And part of the problem with modern environmentalism is they are solving for the wrong variable. That what all of the so-called solutions to global warming have in common, for example, is that they take industrial capitalism as a given and the natural world is having to conform to industrial capitalism. And that is insane, literally, in terms of being out of touch with reality because the, the health of the planet has to be primary because without a healthy planet, you don't have any social system whatsoever. And this is a real problem when you presume that you know, decades ago now, I asked an assistant deputy of the Forest Service, um, and I wasn't trying to make a point, I was just honestly asking, if we determine that, or if, it, if we find out that industrial forestry is incompatible with a healthy living forest, what then? And his response was, um, what do you want us to do, live in mud huts? And that's the entire thing right there is that we would rather kill the planet, we collectively, would rather kill the planet than question the goodies of this way of life. So say um, the environmental movement does, you know, get what it wants essentially, you know, in the Green New Deal and in many of those other, you know, in Europe where they're, you know, trying to run mostly on, on renewables. Um, or at least debatably are. So say, you know, we, we manage to shift well, away from fossil fuels and... So first off, oh. <laughs> first off, this economy can never shift away from fossil fuels and it's not shifting away from fossil fuels. They keep pretending it is. And we'll hear all the time about how Munich or Los Angeles or this or that state or city has s declared that they will go 100% renewable energy by 2025, 2030, 2050, whatever year. Okay, first off, it's crap. And one reason it's crap is because they're confusing electricity with energy. That uh, solar panels, wind, well, first off, what they call renewable is, includes biomass. And biomass is either growing crops to burn, like ethanol, or it is cutting down forests, like wood chips. And the vast majority of renewable energy is, is in most countries cutting down forests. In other countries, the vast majority is hydro, which is, of course, the only good thing you can say environmentally about dams is eventually they fail um, because they kill rivers. They kill rivers above, they kill rivers below, and they aren't even good for global warming because uh, dams have been called, quote, methane bombs because they produce so much methane. In fact, they produce more greenhouse gases than they than does burning coal and oil. It's, they're very, very bad. Um, and also, just ask Sam and how much they like them. And so first, when they talk about renewables, they're including all sorts of stuff that is just destructive on the surface. Second, if you want, we can talk about the destructiveness of wind and solar. But that's not even the real point. The real point here is that there's lying because when they say that they're committing to 100% renewable energy, what they really mean is they're committing to 100% renewable electricity. And electricity is only 20% of total energy usage. And it's not quite so impressive to say we're committing to 20%, because Los Angeles is not gonna get rid of the car. And they're not gonna get rid of natural gas, they're not gonna get rid of any, any of that. Munich is not gonna get rid of the coal for their boilers for, for heating big buildings, and 
around the world, you, the sort of rule of thumb you can use is that is that about 20% of all total energy usage is is electricity. So first off, when they say, "Gosh, we're we're flooding the grid," take 80% off the top right away, and that's functional because there's no way that. So I interviewed Alice Friedman, who has written about. Uh, she wrote a book, I believe, called something like When the Trucks Stop, and it's about trucking and about how, uh, okay, one of the reasons that oil, that this, this culture has metastasized the way it has in the last hundred years is because of oil has an incredibly high energy density. Like, I don't know, something like 43 megajoules per kilogram or something. It's it's, it's a high number, and just to make this work, you can have a, a diesel semi that can go about 600 miles on about 100 pounds of fuel. To have a diesel semi go 600 miles, you would have to have about, oh, and that would have about a 60,000 pound payload. To have a diesel semi go 600 miles on batteries, the batteries would have to weigh about 55,000 pounds, which means you have a 5,000 pound payload, which means why bother? So they do talk about having some electric semis, but those are really just for around town. And if they think you can have, I mean, I want for people watching this to look around right at this moment and ask themselves how many trucks everything they see was on. So this is being filmed on some cameras and even without you moving these cameras around to, to do this, this film, okay, first off you have the trucks involved with, so you let me know when that's too loud and I'll stop. It's coming this way though. It's surprisingly hard to find people who are able to just um, say, almost say the obvious in a way, you know? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. And that is something that I don't understand. I, I've never, I mean, I say the Upton Sinclair quote, but I just, it, it boggles my mind. You know, the, the stuff I write about is not particularly cognitively challenging. It's, it's not like I'm doing this abstract theoretical physics involving, you know, all sorts of differential equations that nobody can understand. <laughs> um, okay, so we just talked about payload. Oh yeah, so I guarantee if somebody looks around their room, they're going to, I mean, every item was on a dozen trucks and I mean, these cameras, the, the, first there were the trucks associated with the mining, then there were the trucks associated with moving it from the, the mine to the smelter, there were the trucks associated with uh, moving it from the smelter to the, um, the foundry, there, was the, there were the trucks associated with then, once it's made, the trucks associated with moving it to a warehouse, moving it to the store. And that, that's only that's only national. Let me know when the sound is low enough that it's okay. And that's only nationally. And then we also have international shipping, which uh, relies on bunker fuel. And 
there's no way that that can all be done on batteries either. It's just the, the whole notion that we can run this, this way of life on, on purely, quote, renewable energy is it's just absurd. Um, but if we did, I mean, the next question is, so to what ends are the energy put? And as long as this, you could have an, 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 well, you can't have, but pretend you had an industrial system that was carbon neutral in terms of its energy usage, it would still not be carbon neutral because it would still continue to deforest. It would still continue to have mining. It would still continue to murder the oceans. And those I mean, does, does the world, does the world really need more skidoos? Does the world really need more jet skis? Does the world really need more? More cities? Does the world need more cars? No, the world doesn't need those. We, we say, and part of the problem is that we can get confused over what the real world is. You know, when I used to give talks at universities, or I used to do this when I was in college, um, we would ask each other, what are you going to do when you get out in the real world? And what that would mean is, what are you going to have to do when you have to get a job? And so the economy is the real world. But the economy is not the real world. This is the real world. I mean, this right here is the real world. And, um, So again, even if they were able to I think we're going. Yeah. Even if they were able to power a destructive Okay, let me put it this way. Pretend that space aliens came down from outer space and they were deforesting the planet and they were destroying soil everywhere, and they were killing the oceans, and they were changing the climate, would we really care if they stopped powering their economy of occupation with dilithium crystals and started powering it with trilithium crystals? No, it doesn't really matter, ultimately, a solar-powered chainsaw is just as harmful to a forest. I don't know if it's just as harmful, but it is harmful to a forest, just as is. I'll say that. A solar-powered chainsaw is harmful to a forest, just as a, a, a fossil fuel-powered chainsaw is. Oh, one more thing I want to bring up to this that people never talk about is have you interviewed somebody about Jevons Paradox? No. Okay, this is really important. Do you know Jevons Paradox? I actually don't know. Okay, this is great stuff, or it's terrible stuff. We also have to bring in Jevons Paradox. And Jevons was a, yeah, an economist living in the 19th century who studied coal use and studied he wanted to know what would happen if you find a more efficient way to use coal. What would that do to coal demand? Because you think if you use coal more efficiently, therefore you use less of it. Right? That makes sense that, that if you can heat your house with half as much coal, then clearly you're going to use half as much coal. But it doesn't work that way at all. What happens is increases in efficiency for use of coal increase use of coal because now it's more economical to use. And so, I mean, this makes sense that if your coal costs you half as much, if you got the money, you may as well make your house bigger. Which is exactly what's happened, by the way. Over the last 30 years, energy efficiency in homes has increased by about 30%. Guess how much home size has increased in the last 30 years? About 30%. Which means they're using the same amount of energy to heat the home except the home now has more embodied energy in it because it's bigger, more furniture. 
and fewer people living in it, by the way. And so what he found, and, and think about this in terms of capitalism with its growth imperative, that if you have, if energy usage is one of your limitations for your, it's one of your expenses and limitations for your business, and you now are able to cut that price in half, what you're gonna do is expand your business. And we're in Northern California right now, and um, Northern California is, if we talk about one crop Northern California is known for, it's marijuana. And let's say you have a marijuana grow, and let's say your energy expenses are a thousand a month. And let's say your profit is, you know, after, after labor and everything else, you're making $3,000 a month profit. Uh, your total expenses are $2,000 a month, I'm just making numbers up. And your income is $5,000, so it's $3,000 profit. And then you figure out a way, you know, they, they bring out a new light that is energy efficient and it's gonna lower your energy from 1,000 to 500. Either A, you can save that 500 bucks a month, or you could double your growth size. And you could double your growth size, which means you're using a lot more fertilizer, a lot more soil, a lot more of everything, and you're making a lot more money and under the capitalist growth imperative, that's what happens. And they found that the Jevons paradox applies not just to coal use, but to everything. So what happens is, and this, this goes back, this is true forever, that every time they've added a new energy source onto existing sources, it has not decreased the original energy source use. So you have wood, okay? So you have wood as a, as a main energy source, and then when they started using oil, wood didn't go down. It just added on top. And then when they added hydro, Sure, but there's something else I want to say first, which that reminded me, is one way to think about this, and Max was the one I, I first saw develop this, um, one way to think about this is which would be environmentally better, cars that get one mile per gallon or cars that get 100 miles per gallon? And at first you think cars that may get 100 miles per gallon would be better for the environment because you're using less gas, and, but when you really think about it, if you only got one mile per gallon with your car, you wouldn't take pleasure drives. You wouldn't drive very much. Like the other day, there's a, there's a nice uh, little taqueria just about five miles north of town. And five miles north of town, I get 35 miles a gallon. It's worth it to, you know, three bucks a gallon to, to go up and get the taco. But if I only got one mile per gallon, there's no way I'm paying an extra 10 miles total. So that's 30 bucks, extra 30 bucks for those tacos. No way I'm gonna go do that. So the point is I drove more because I have better efficiency. And this is applicable on a larger scale too, that if you have every time that we as a culture have added on a new source of energy, it has not decreased the previous source. So you have wood, and then you add oil to that, it didn't decrease use of wood, it just meant they could do more things and they could uh, use the oil in addition to the gas. And then they added hydro. Did that decrease oil? No, oh sorry, coal. I'm gonna start over because I got the order wrong. So you have, you have first wood and uh, then when they added coal to that, did that decrease wood use? No, actually increased coal, wood use. And then when they added oil to coal, did that decrease coal use? No, it made mining coal more efficient. And then they added hydro. Did that decrease the others? No, it increased. Every time you've added them on, and this is absolutely true with wind, solar, all those, they don't actually decrease coal and oil. They simply add on and make more energy available for people to use for bigger marijuana grows, which is not a joke. I mean, at this point, new marijuana grows are, I think, like the fourth biggest user of, of electricity in Colorado. 
Um, it's, it's a significant use, or Bitcoin mining for crying out loud, which is just the perfect example of, of using energy to make nothing. It's just extraordinary. Um, anyway, so every time they add on, and this is not just about energy too. I saw a study a couple years ago about how every material out there that as we have become more efficient at using it, they studied 57 materials, I think, and all of them we're using more now than we were before. The only ones for which this wasn't true were ones like asbestos that were decreased for reasons having not to do with efficiency but with safety, or uh, wool because there's actually less wool used because of polyester. Um, but all the others were have increased as our efficiency at using them has 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 increased. So it's the whole thing is a pipe dream on that level too. You cannot have, and here's the thing too. I became an environmentalist really in second grade when I was about seven or eight or however old you are in second grade, because they put in a subdivision right next to where I lived, and I saw meadows turn into a subdivision, white box houses. And I remember thinking, even when I was seven or eight years old, where are the meadowlarks going to go? Where are the garter snakes going to go? Where are the cottonwood trees going to go? And I remember thinking, they can't keep doing this forever or they'll run out of space and the others will be forced into nothingness. And I didn't have this language, that's the language I had at seven or eight. The language I didn't have at seven or eight is you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And I don't understand why people don't understand that. And the worse, the longer it goes on, the worse it's gonna be. If, if civilization would have ended 200 years ago, people in the Eastern United States could still eat passenger pigeons. And people here could still eat, eat salmon. And we're, painting the entire world and ourselves into a terrible, terrible corner. So part of the problem is that, and part of the reason we get confused about what's real, is that we have been made dependent upon the system. So if your experience is that your food comes from a grocery store and your water comes from a tap, you will defend to the death the system that brings those to you because your life depends on it. If on the other hand, your food comes from a land base and your water comes from a river, you'll defend to the death them because your life depends on it. And this is just classic abusive dynamics that, that one of the things abusers do is they separate their victims from their support system. So, um, you know, if, if, they're, if somebody gets married to an abuser, the abuser will do what they can to uh, break their ties with their family often and their friends. And this is what cults do too um, because if you have no support system you if you do have a support system you're less likely to put up with the abuse. You're more likely to be able to use that support system. That support system will help you escape and this economic system has systematically and functionally inserted itself between us and the source of life, with uh, us and the planet. And it's done that in many ways intentionally. There was a 1830s pro-slavery philosopher who was arguing with his northern abolitionist buddy uh, about the conditions, the land ownership conditions in which it's in the uh, slave owner's best interest to own slaves or not own slaves. And it's pretty simple. If there's a lot of land and not many people, then the only way you can get people to work for you is the point of a gun because if there's a lot of land and not many people, the people have access to land, which means they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they have access to self-sufficiency, which means they don't have to go to work for you. If, on the other hand, you've got a lot of people packed into a little space, then the people have to go to work for you because they don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency. A couple more examples of this. One is the laws of apartheid were written specifically to get workers for mines because the local people 
were living in cashless economies. They were living in self-sufficient communities. And so what they did is they passed hut taxes, poll taxes, dog taxes, so that people would have to have cash. And in order to pay the cash for the tax, somebody has to go to work in a mine. That was sort of the genesis of it, was specifically to separate people, to force people into the economy. And the problem is that we are, almost, almost everyone now in the industrialized nations are dependent upon a system that is killing the planet. And we're dependent for our lives on it, which means that most of us are going to defend that system to the death. And that's a problem. Another part of the problem is that at every step of the way, our choices are, are made to seem reasonable. And in fact, they are reasonable from within the, the framing that we're given. And I, I think about this in terms of one of the things that the, the Nazis did is that they would, would give what one writer called brain busters, I believe, where they would get the Jews to there would be two colors of identity cards. And is it better to get a red card or a green card? And they would then try to figure out which card they should get. And it didn't matter, but it kept them occupied. And is it better if I sign in, if when I, when I end up in a camp, is it better if I say I'm a shoemaker or a tinker? Doesn't matter, really, but you're nervous about that. And then in addition, at every step of the way, it is in your rational best interest to not resist. So is it better to get an ID card or resist and possibly get killed? Is it better to go to a ghetto or resist and possibly get killed? Is it better to get on a cattle car or resist and possibly get killed? That every step of the way, it's in your best interest to not resist. And, you know, we see this I mean, this is applicable to, I mean, to, to per, interpersonal, interpersonal abusive relationships as well. That, you know, is it better to make a stand right now and possibly get hit? No, I think I'll just, I'll just roll over on this one. It's easier. Um, and And, and, and the same is, is, is true here. Do we want to... And it's not just resist or be killed. It's also humans are social creatures. And there is tremendous pressure to conform. I think about this years ago. I wrote about this in one or another of my books. Years ago, I took my mom to Walmart and for whatever reason, I didn't feel like going in that day. It wasn't a political protest or anything. I just didn't, I didn't feel like going around Walmart. So I sat on the curb outside reading a book. And it was extraordinary the dirty looks I got from people because I wasn't sitting on a bench. I was just sitting on a curb. Everybody who walked by is like giving me this dirty look uh, because, and it wasn't because I had unauthorized long hair and I didn't have unauthorized dirty clothes. It was simply because I was sitting in an unauthorized place. Like, how can you sit there? I felt like so insecure about it that I went and sat back in the car, you know, and read in the car, even though it was a nice day outside. It's just the power of, uh... I mean, I don't want to say, I'm not going to put this in a pejorative sense, you know, the power of turning people into sheeple or herd mentality. I don't want to say any of that, just the power of, The power of the disapproving look can, can be enough to, uh, to stifle a lot of dissent. You know, we see this all over the place. I mean, this is way off topic, so you're going to cut this, and that would be great if you cut it. But it's like, this is one reason I don't really recognize the left anymore, is because the left has become so interested in censorship. The left is canceling anybody who disagrees with any of their tenets. It's just, 
it's just a, it's a crazy thing, but okay, that little off-camera rant is over. But it's it's just so the, there is not only the power of 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 they actually hold your life in their hands, but there's also and it's in your rational best interest to not resist, personally, but there's also this tremendous social pressure. Oh, there's another thing I want to mention I think is pretty interesting. Uh, it's called the, some, I don't know exactly what it's called, but it's something like the second opinion test or something, that they did this test where they put a bunch of people in a waiting room and they would ask, then they, sorry, I'll start over, they, they put a, a bunch of people in a waiting room and then they would have one person who was a part of the, the, the crew would come in and say some really offensive position. Like they might make a really racist joke or something. And what they found was that everybody's response was in many ways profoundly influenced by not the first joke, but by, there would be another person who participates in the experiment, who is a part of the crew, who would then either laugh at the joke and go, that's a great one, and if there was the second opinion verify, validating the first one, then people were much more likely to not judge it negatively. But if the second opinion was, wow, that's not cool that you said that joke, then everybody else would be more likely to disapprove. And this is, both terrifying and also pretty cool in that we can also, I think, use this, and this also is used often for social change. You know, this is sort of the, the, the thing about first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. That another way to say this is, I don't remember what thriller novel I read this in, but in some thriller novel or another, I, I read the first one through the door always gets killed. And that struck me as being true discourse-wise, too. That the first one who says something that's really unpopular, it's like, oh, God, that's stupid. And then a couple more people say it, and eventually some people start going, huh, that's pretty interesting. And that's happened to me, too. I remember the first person I ever read who suggested that evolution might not be based on strict competition, but instead on cooperation, it was John Livingston. And when I first read that, it's like, oh, boy, he's crazy. That's just silly. And a few years later, I found myself completely agreeing with him. But when I first read it, it's like, that goes against everything I've ever been taught. That's nuts. And in some ways, that's been kind of my job, is to say, look, this isn't sustainable, and then have people laugh at me. What do you think are the um, sort of core tenets of this industrial civilization? And what is its logical conclusion if it doesn't get stopped, I guess? What do you mean by tenets? Do you mean physical? Do you mean psychological? Do you mean? Well, I mean the values, I guess, almost. And what I mean, what? So, what, so, go ahead. so I think. A central value of civilization is that the continuation of this way of life, the continuation of civilization itself is more important than anything else on earth, anything else in the universe. It's more important than the lives of passenger pigeons, it's more important than the lives of forests, it's more important than the lives of human beings. It's... Have you talked to anybody about Lewis Mumford? Okay. Lewis Mumford wrote... Well, Lewis Mumford came up with the concept of a technic, T-E-C-H-N-I-C. Technologies don't arise out of a vacuum. 
they arise from certain social conditions and then once a technology has been created it gives rise to more social conditions it influences society so the Talo Indians lived here for 12,500 years and they didn't invent refrigerators it's not because they were too stupid to invent refrigerators it's because their social system and the ecological systems gave them no need to you've, when you've got salmon running up the river you don't need refrigerators because it meat stays much fresher in the river than it does even in a refrigerator and what Mumford realized was that certain okay so so the combination of technology and society he called a technic and what he realized is that some technics are democratic and some are authoritarian some technologies spring from and give rise to democratic decision-making processes and one example would be um, basket weaving um, because nobody can control your access to the materials to make baskets and anybody can make them they can make them poorly or well I'm not saying there's not skill involved but it's a it's a technology that does not require an authoritarian system and other technologies require authoritarian systems anything that involves mining would be one example because mines are one of the first uh, forms of slavery and they're also uh, incredibly destructive in other means and once you have a mine you have to protect the, 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 the ore and then you have to protect the smelted ore you have to protect the metal so it gives rise to military and the police uh, whereas again basket weaving does not and a really good example of this is I was being interviewed several years ago by this guy who was a dedicated Marxist who believed that you could have an industrial system with only purely voluntary exchanges there would be no uh, exploitation of anyone and he believed you can have cities and still have this I said great in your city how do you get around he said on a bus I said great what's the bus made of he said metal I said great where do you get the metal he said mines I said great so how do you get people to work in the mines he said you pay them a lot I said well you know we got the whole slavery problem but I'll give you that one but what do you do about the fact that every hard rock mine on the planet has polluted groundwater and rivers so what do you do you know obviously non-humans aren't important to you so what do you do about the the humans who live next to the river and he said well you pay them to move I said great what happens if they've been living there for 5,000 years they will not move he said you pay them more I said no their ancestors are buried there and they won't leave their ancestors so they're not going to move he said how many are there I said I don't know 500 what difference does it make he said, well the million people in the city vote and they vote that the 500 people have to leave and then you kick them off I said great so what you've done is you've gone from purely voluntary exchanges to democratic empire land theft from indigenous people and genocide all within less than a minute also you can have a bus and the point is that that's an authoritarian system and Lewis Mumford called them authoritarian not only because the systems required authoritarian power structures but also because the systems the, the the technologies themselves become authoritarian the technologies themselves take on a logic of their own and the technologies themselves are in charge so ask yourself when people build cities are they built mainly for human beings or for cars they're built for cars or we talk all the time about gosh how are we going to save the planet from the fossil fuel economy well if the fossil fuel economy weren't in charge we would simply stop the fossil fuel economy but it's in charge so much that we can't or here's this people ask I used to ask this at talks all the time so do you believe that governments take better care of human beings or corporations I asked that of tens of thousands of people. Nobody ever said it takes better care of human beings. The corporations are in charge. Corporations are a figment. They are. So Lewis Mumford also talked about 
what he called the mega machine. I think, I don't know if he said this was the most important invention humans ever made, but I think it is. I think it's more important than the screw, than the lever, than the wheel. The mega machine is a social machine that uses humans as as replaceable parts. And the first mega machine he talks about was the one that was used to build the pyramids, which are of course giant tombs. And that did not escape him, that the end point of the mega machine is a necropolis, is a city of the dead. But anyway, he thought that this top-down bureaucratic military style bureaucracy was that's what he called the mega machine, and that's what I think is the most important machine humans have ever created. And the reason I think it's really important is because I think humans are, like probably all other creatures, we're fundamentally contentious. And we're not evil, we're not nasty, we just poke each other and we get, we have fights. And, you know, I was. We don't always agree, and this is true for, it's like the Okanagan Indian, Jeanette Armstrong, said to me, you know, we have just as many squabbles as white people do. The big difference is that I know that my great-grandchildren might marry your great-grandchildren, so we have to figure out ways to get along. And the point is, we, we, we go at each other. Actually, I shouldn't be going like this. I should be going like this. We go at each other, and anybody who's ever tried to do a project with 20 people knows that, so it is a miracle that they're able to get a million people working for the Coca-Cola Corporation, or a million people, or 10 million people, or however many were in the German army invading Russia. That's, that is an extraordinary accomplishment. But what's happened is that in an army especially, they're very clearly putting the ends of the army above the ends of themselves. The army is more important than their own lives. And I'm not saying one should never dedicate oneself to, one, to a cause, but what I'm saying is these machines take on logic of their own. And the, the logic of civilization is that this machine-like social structure is more important than life on Earth. And the end point of it is, as Mumford talked about, the, the end of life on Earth. And that's also part of the reason we don't resist, is he had this great discussion about what he called the magnificent bribe. He was asking, how is it that so many of us buy into this? And the short answer is access to ice cream 24-7. But he talks about the magnificent bribe wherein we are given, I mean, you or you or, or I have more power than, than pharaohs in ancient Egypt. We have, they didn't have access to ice cream 24-7. They didn't have access to any of the stuff we have. They couldn't travel from Egypt to Berlin in three hours or however long a flight takes. We have tremendous power. And what Mumford said that the the brilliant thing about the current autocratic system, which makes it so much smarter than the sort of half-baked authoritarian systems that are based on smashing somebody in the head if they disagree with you, is that there has been a promise made to most of the people that you will get access to these goodies. And in exchange for that, what you have to do is pledge allegiance to the system, and you also have to ask only for the things that the system can provide for you in quantifiable amounts, in processed amounts. All you have to do is say, yes, you can have the salmon, I'll get my ice cream, I'll get my open heart surgery, I'll get my life-saving drugs, I'll get my ability to drive from San Francisco to Seattle, or I don't know how long it takes to drive from San Francisco to Seattle. I'll get the ability to drive from San Francisco to LA in four hours. 
I'll get the ability to fly around the world in however long that takes. And in exchange, I will give you the oceans. I will give you everything else you want. And I will give you my life, too. I will give you the hours of my days. I will give you, I will work for you. But just give me my MTV. So a lot of people. Um... And, and, and the point of all this is that the end point of all this, Mumford asked, can democracy survive? He said, the question is absurd because life itself can't survive this. So the end point, the end point, if we don't stop this culture, is the end of life on Earth. It will kill everything that it can. And, and what is the, years ago I was doing, an, uh, uh, I was sharing the stage with Ward Churchill, and he and I were chatting backstage, and I, I said, God, you know, it's so stupid. The Germans were, I mean, as well as being committing these atrocities, they were so stupid to keep such careful, meticulous records of the Holocaust. I mean, because you know if you lose, that's going to be used against you. That's crazy. He just looked at me and said, Derek, what do you think GNP is? And what GNP is, is a measure of how fast you're converting the living into the dead. Because the living forest does not contribute to GNP. What con contributes to GNP is two by fours. Living schools of fish in the ocean don't contribute to GNP. When you convert them to fish sticks, they convert, con contribute to GNP. And you, yourself, don't contribute to GNP, except when you buy gas, when you buy a camera, when you buy clothes, when you are sick and somebody has to give you medicine. But you, yourself, just by breathing in the air, that's not monetizable, that's not part of GNP. So a lot of people think that progress is good, and I think progress is entirely context dependent. And if you have to walk 10 miles, and you've walked five and then you walk another mile, well, maybe that progress is good, depends. If you're walking 10 miles toward a slaughterhouse to get slaughtered, I don't think progress is good. If you're walking 10 miles to meet your beloved, progress is good. Um, I think that progress, I mean, a disease can progress, and a campaign of, pro of, of propaganda can progress, and your film can progress. I think that your film progressing is probably a good thing. And by, pro I'm, by probably, I presume you want to finish it at some point, so progress is good toward, toward that goal. Um, but it's dependent upon the goal, and it's dependent on, and so we can talk about, I mean, so it's absurd to talk about progress generically. It does, it's, it's meaningless. It's, and one could, I think that it comes down to particulars, and Okay, I have Crohn's disease, and the treatments for pro Crohn's disease have progressed such that when I was 24, uh, I had most of my colon removed. And if they had the medicines then that they have now, I probably would not have had to have my colon removed. So that's progress, but we can't even take that out of context because at the same time, the world has been getting killed more because of this more highly technologized medical system in terms of, I mean, in, 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 in addition to everything else being more highly technologized. And we can take specific examples that, um, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? 59. That's why, when's your birthday? Uh, April 3rd. April 3rd. Uh, Oh, so I'm older than you are. Yeah, I'm December 60. Oh, okay. Um, so, your father and I are, are we the last generation to have grown up without computers? Or is there one after us? I didn't get my first computer until in the 80s, so I was 20s. Personal computer, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. So are we the last ones, really, or, or where does generation... My, so my, my... 
youngest brother is eight years younger, and he was a teenager. He had a he had a computer. So yeah. Okay. And I don't know if it's a I don't believe it's a coincidence that children when I was young, including myself, spent more time outside. There was a study about 10 years ago of children, I believe in the UK, they spend an average of eight minutes a day outside. Um, to which the writer and cartoonist Stephanie McMillan quipped, outside what, say the kids, because they don't even know there's an outside. I, I knew somebody back in the 90s who was teaching, uh, teaching children, and one day they took a, um, a field trip to the botanical gardens and the children were running away from butterflies because they thought they would sting them. And so I, I think I think that there are you know there are costs to everything and you know I took a year of graduate school in economics and the one thing I remember most is that they pounded into us, there is no free lunch. And, and what are the relationships between the progress in computing and, oh, well, first off, globalization would not be possible without computers in the way it is currently situated. Modern shipping couldn't take place without computers. Um, modern, oh, we're seeing a, one side effect of this right now. Um, people who uh, are watching this don't know that you are wearing a mask right now because of COVID. And um, when I got interested in COVID was a couple days after Wuhan shut down. And the reason I got really interested is because two days after Wuhan shut down, uh, a Hyundai factory in South Korea shut down. And the reason they shut down is because back 50 years ago, back 50 years ago, routinely, if somebody had a factory, they would keep on hand enough materials to last them a month. And then when they start getting down to a couple weeks, they would order more materials. But with instantaneous, pretty much instantaneous global travel, and also instantaneous communication allowed by computers, um, and instantaneous inventory, they went to what's called a just-in-time system, which means that instead of wasting all that money on inventory, you now order parts the day before you need them, and then they come in that day. So what happened is when you had an illness a thousand miles away, this factory had to shut down. And my point is that without this just-in-time system made by and for, these computers, uh, the economic effects of the current pandemic would have been reduced. And that's just one cost. I mean, there, there are, and that's just an economic cost. I mean, there are costs associated with everything. And mainly those costs are paid by the natural world. That a computer itself is not made out of nothing. And this is what people tend to forget. Um, so, so, I have, again, I'm not going to say progress is bad because it completely depends. I think, you know, my mom died of cancer a couple years ago and the progress of the disease was, from my perspective, bad. I mean, it was, it was a, the whole thing was horrific. Um, and as I said earlier, I mean, you can have a good relationship can progress and that's a good thing. Um, but if you're asking specifically about technological progress, I don't even call it technological progress. I call it technological escalation because it's not really progress. Um, so I don't call technological progress progress. I call it technological escalation because what it really is, is an escalation of the capacity of those wielding the technology to control at a distance. And so in that sense, 
again, I don't, I don't the, the word progress, I don't believe is appropriate. It's, I don't believe it's accurate. I believe what's accurate is, is escalation. So, um, given that industrial civilization is destroying the world, do you think we need to go back to a pre-industrial, potentially pre-agrarian era? So do I think that we need to go to a pre-industrial, pre-agrarian uh, way of living? I think 25 years ago, 30 years ago now, I was riding a car with my friend George Draffin, with whom I wrote a couple of books, and we were stuck in traffic in Seattle. And I was just making conversation. I said, so George, if you could live at any level of technology that you wanted, what would it be? And George was in a terrible mood. He said, Derek, that's a really stupid question because we can fantasize whatever we want, but the only level of technology that's sustainable is the Stone Age. We will be living there again someday, and the only question is what's left of the world when we get there. So what I think, actually it doesn't matter what I think. What is true is that the only level of technology that has ever been sustainable is the Stone Age. The Tala lived here for 12,500 years. They didn't have agriculture as we know it. Um, they lived by hunting and gathering. Um, they did make land use decisions. They weren't some sort of noble savage doing everything by instinct. They, uh, they made land use decisions, but the difference was that they were planning on living here for the next 500 years. And if you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years, you make different land use decisions. You don't kill the salmon. Why would, who, would, who would be stupid enough to kill a salmon when you want your great, 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 great grandchildren to eat them? That's, that's not even counting the salmon having their own wonderful existence for themselves. That's not even counting the wonderful effects of the salmon on the forest. That's just, that's one of the things that, always, that has always struck me about this is sometimes I get accused of being, gosh, you must not like humans or something. I was like, no, the ones who don't like humans are the ones who are killing everything on the planet so that humans won't be able to survive 100 years from now. And What do you want the future to look like then? You know, if, if, <coughs> if it is a necessity that we return to essentially the Stone Age, which usually people say is a joke, but like literally. Um, well, what? the question to ask is, what is sustainable? And agriculture has never been sustainable. And you can have people as diverse as Richard Manning and, um, oh shoot. Well, since I can't remember the other guy's name right now, I'm gonna start the sentence over. Okay. Um, agriculture has never been sustainable. Um, multiple writers have written the same sentence, which is sustainable agriculture is an oxymoron. And and it's the same with mining. There has never been a sustainable mine. There, there, there are mines from ancient Rome that are still polluting the groundwater and still polluting the, the whole, the soil. Um, there's a, a mine from a Roman era in, I believe, Lebanon that uh, to this day, the goats who eat there don't get parasites. And the reason they don't get parasites is because their intestines are so poisonous. Uh, and that they're poisonous because they eat the, 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 the plants that grow in that soil. And what I, what I want and what every cell in my body wants is for us to have some sort of voluntary transformation where we realize how destructive this way of life is and we start by throttling down the overblown technology. If they made me in charge of everything tomorrow, I wouldn't say, okay, we're deindustrializing today. I would start with the easy things. It's like no more retractable stadium roofs, no more golf courses, you know, it's like, Start with the stuff that's, no more lawns, you know? Just start with the stuff that's painless. And then start from there moving toward stuff that hurts a little bit and then hurts a little bit more. Um, and I would change the subsidies. Uh, right now on the National Forest, timber sales,
cost. I mean, they, they don't make as much money as they cost, and uh, so they are subsidizing them to destroy the forest. Subsidize people to, to fix forests for a while until, until the system's no longer functioning. Right now, the world's commercial fishing fleets are subsidized to a value greater than their entire catch. So just pay them all to stay home. You know, pay them all to, to do something else. Pay them all to help the fish live. And every cell in my body wants for us to do something like that, but I don't see it happening. I don't see any indication that people are moving the right direction, either personally or socially. Um, the destruction of the planet is increasing. Um, just in my lifetime, wildlife has decreased by about 40% across the board, 40 to 50%. And all biological indicators are going the wrong direction. So what do I want the future to look like? I want the future to look like, I mean, for crying out loud, we can't even get population. We can't even have decent conversations about population. If anybody says that there are more humans on the planet than the planet can support, they're accused of being racist and, and awful human beings. And that's not even suggesting how we should deal with population. And it'd be really easy to deal with population in a non-draconian matter, which is right now about half the children born on the planet are not actively wanted. So provide free birth control to every woman on the planet and give her the actual choice. Provide reproductive freedom to everyone on the planet. Population starts to decline. Of course, to do that, all we have to do is deal with capitalism's growth imperative and the Abrahamic religions that are promoting men's control of women's bodies. We can do that, right? The point is that there are many technical things we could do if that would soften the crash. But I don't see us doing it. I just see us leaning into the crash more and more, leaning into the, the, the things that are causing the crash. And so what I want is for a world being renewed. What I, what I believe is going to happen is, is more horrific than any of us can imagine. As, as even most environmentalists continue to push for this way of life rather than life on the planet. What do you think lies ahead? Honestly, unimaginable horror. Um, I think A world increasingly impoverished of real life, of wildlife, of nature. I think, I think if, if we don't have ecological collapse, I think we have, we face an increasingly uh, regimented society where some of us receive more and more goodies and more and more virtual goodies and more and more of us prefer a virtual reality to a real reality. And meanwhile, poor humans continue to starve and poor non-humans continue to starve and soil continues to be pauperized and I think that old joke about um, when mom ain't happy ain't nobody in the family happy I think about that with soil that when the soil ain't happy ain't nobody happy soil is the basis of everything on the land and the real the real one is the ocean. I mean, that's, if the ocean ain't happy, then surely ain't nobody happy. And there are stolid scientists who are saying the oceans could be devoid of fish in another 
30 years now. When I first started saying that, it was 40 years. And things are getting worse. Um, for me, everything is pretty straightforward. That if I start to feel bad, if I start to get confused, I just try to think so if blue whales could take on human manifestation, what would they do? And if delta smelt could take on human manifestation, and coho salmon, and del norte salamanders, and California condors, if they could take on human manifestation, and prairie dogs, what would they do? And I mean, I often ask, you know, if, if if coho salmon could take on human manifestation, how long would the dams last? Would they last overnight? Would they last a week? I doubt it. Um, so for me, the thing that changes everything is seeing this from the perspective of wildlife, seeing this from the perspective. You know, 30 years ago, I was at this little gathering of of maybe 10, 12 activists who were going to start this campaign. And before we started, we asked, so why are you doing this? And everybody's answer was some version of the same. One woman said, for the critters. Another one got up and walked over to her desk and picked up a picture. And it was a picture of, when you first look at it, it's just the trunk of a old growth Douglas fir. But when you look more closely, you can see there's a little itty bitty hole in the middle of the trunk and a little itty bitty owl sticking your head out of the trunk. And he said, I'm doing it for her. And so people ask me all the time, so what should I do? And the first step is always, always shift your loyalty away from the system and to the living planet. And once you do that, I mean, what you do then is up to you. I mean, it's different for different people. If you have a gift for making films, then, then that's what you should do. And if you have a gift for, for writing, then that's what you should do. And if you have a gift for organizing, that's what you should do. If you have a gift for explosives, you know, it's like we all have, my only D in college, by the way, was in quantitative analysis chemistry lab. So you really don't want me. I, I literally, one time, a quantitative analysis chemistry lab, I literally spilled my sample onto the, the lab table, and instead of starting over, I just scooped it up and remeasured. It's like, this, which is how you end up with a D, um, which at least still was passing. Um, anyway, the point is that one of the good things about everything being so messed up is no matter where you look, there's so much work to be done. And like I have this friend who works on, she used to run the Battle Women's Program for the state of New York, and now she works as an advocate for women in the New York court system. And she does wonderful. Sorry, uh, I just had battery. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so um, I know this woman who used to run the Battered Women's Program in the state of New York, and she's relentless in her defense of, of battered women. And, you know, I would never suggest that she go do something about salmon because she's doing cr incredible work. And so, really, you know, no matter what you love, it's under assault. Whether you love long form thinking, whether you love salmon, whether you love soil, whether you love ground squirrels, doesn't matter. They're under assault. So find what you love and then defend it. And find what your gifts are and, and use them. And one way, people talk about the danger of getting burned out, but the way to not get burned out is to find what you get off on doing and then do that. And you know, I get off on trying to find out, figure out the perceived relationship or the relationship between perceived entitlement 
exploitation, excuse me, perceived entitlement, exploitation, and atrocity. And so basically I've condemned myself to a life of homework, but I totally get off on doing that. And I know, like I had this friend who, I caught, we were talking one day, and I said, so what are you going to do this afternoon? He said, oh, no, I'm kind of bored. I think I'm going to go over to Walmart and leaflet outside as a, you know, against Walmart. I was like, that's crazy talk, you know? I mean, that's great, but she got off on doing that. That would be terrifying to me. And so, you know, find what you love, defend it. Find what you love doing, defend that. Find what your gifts are and use them. And then, you know, we all have to, what, what I want from my work is every day that passes is 200 more species driven extinct. And if my work can somehow contribute to civilization coming down one day sooner, that's 200 species not gone. And I think often about this image that a friend of mine gave me decades ago, which is when you go to demolish a building, in a city, what you do, I mean, when you're doing it professionally, not like terrorism or anything, when professional demolishers, they try to put the charges such they make the building collapse in place and cause as little harm to the surroundings as possible. And my work is also really about, if this culture continues as it is, we will get where we're going and it will be bad. And if we can, do whatever we can to make it collapse in place with as little harm to the surroundings as possible, by which I mean not only non-humans, but we all know that when patriarchal civic society collapses, rates of rape and battering go up. So as well as wanting to protect the natural world, I want to protect those who are living through what is going to be, and through what already is for many, an incredibly horrific time. Whatever we can do to reduce the harm through that period is a positive good. Yeah. So I, um, so I've been reading one of your books from about 30 years ago, I think, um, in the 90s, I guess. And, you know, you're saying, you know, basically that, yeah, things are bad then. <laughs> now it's 25 years later. Um, and there are, when well, we've been talking to a lot of people like you who think, yeah, we need to really do something. And yet, there, and yet for every one person thinking like this, there are, I don't know, 100,000 people that aren't. And I'm not, I'm not really interested in, in figuring out what, what, like the ideal world, like what, um, ideally, the, you know, all things falling into place, what the world should look like. But it's like, it's more about what the hell what the hell can we do to stop this? What can, that, what, what can we actually do to, it's like, I'm not interested in trying to save the world, I'm interested in saving the world, you know? How, how do we do that? Like, I, I, I think I'm at a loss for that, <laughs> I don't know. So what do we do? Yeah. Um, well, I know that my environmental mentor and friend, John Osborne, when people ask him why he does what he does, he always says, as things become increasingly chaotic, I want to make sure that some doors remain open. And what he means by that is that if bull trout are still around in five years, they may still be around in 100. But if they're gone in five, they're gone forever. So I think it is of, it's absolutely vital for us to protect every scrap of wildlife and every scrap of wild place that we can and to protect every native forest, to protect every, every bit of ocean that we can. Um, that's, a, that's one thing. The next is that I think another thing we can do is we can, on my locker room wall in college, there was, you know, they put all those cliches and one of the cliches was opportunity, I'm sorry, one of the cliches was luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And I think about this a lot for the like Arab Spring a few years ago that I was all excited when that started because wow pro-democracy forces rising, they're all mobilizing, but the pro-democracy forces didn't win. Who won the first round in Egypt 
was a Muslim Brotherhood who had been organizing since at least the 20s. And who were on the second round was the Western-backed dictatorship that had even more power than the Muslim Brotherhood. And my point is that we need to organize, 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 and prepare, prepare, prepare for when the time is right to do whatever is right in that moment. That this is why in sports you practice and practice and practice so that in a game it's all natural. And this is why militaries train and train and train so that when the time comes that it's for real, you know what to do. And so I think we need to protect every wild place. We need to organize now um, and we need to uh, prepare food systems now. Kropotkin talked about how so many revolutions are founded because of bread, because in 60 days you start to starve. And people, you know, Napoleon famously commented that an army marches on his stomach. And uh, Rommel famously commented that uh, quartermasters win battles because the, uh, you know, the side with the, a bit more gasoline is the one that wins. So we need to organize now. We need to have our food systems in place so that we can break the dominant culture's monopoly on providing food, which means providing life to people. So what I would love to see is the permaculture wing start to see it, or the permaculture movement start to see itself as a quartermaster wing of the revolution and of the suppliers for the revolution. And many of the top permaculture people are completely on board for that. It's, it's, that's really wonderful. Um, so protect wild places. Um, we, need, we need propaganda, and I'm using that in a value neutral sense. We need uh, people, to put it a different way, we need people doing the analysis. Proper diagnosis is the first step toward correct treatment. We need people doing proper diagnosis. Because for every person who's putting out a film like this, you know, you got people like Josh Fox putting out films, or just forget Josh Fox, you got people putting out films. This is, I did a, a little talk about this one time, but it just killed me that uh, so many movies about the environment will un do, the, do a good analysis, and then their solutions are just ridiculous. They always fail at the end because they don't talk about resistance. So Food Inc. is a great example that they talk about the food systems being destructive, harming local communities, harming soil, everything else. The solution was to buy yogurt from Walmart. For crying out loud, that's just that's a failure of courage. So there's what we need to do also. We need to tell the truth. We need to tell the truth as we understand it to be. Damn the consequences. Um, and then what we go ahead. And then what we need to do on a larger scale. We need to recognize that war has long since been declared on the natural world. And the way you win a war is by destroying your enemy's capacity to wage war. What won World War II was two things. One is the Soviet Union's army defeated the German army, destroyed their capacity to wage war, and the German, I'm sorry, and the British and, and American air forces destroyed the German capacity, industrial capacity. And again, if you were a non-human taking on human form and you recognize that this culture is waging war against the natural world, I think one of the things that one would do is start to look at critical infrastructure. And so more broadly, what we need to do is stop thinking. We need to start thinking like members of a serious resistance. This happened in World War II. It's very interesting that when France first fell to the Nazis, uh, there were a lot of uh, members of the French resistance thought that things like the elegance of Parisian women would cause the Germans to change their mind. So that's real. And it didn't take long for them to escalate, but you gotta move through those phases. You have to start by thinking, yeah, if we just, if we just present a good alternative, people will take it. Maybe. 
If that doesn't work, then you move to the next step. You know, Chris Hedges has talked about how those in power really determine the form that revolution takes because nobody except, except sociopaths and sadists really want militant resistance. Nobody wants to do that. We want to make changes peacefully. We want to make changes. So you try this, and if it doesn't work, you try this. If that doesn't work, you try that. And I mean, the, the short answer is what I want people to do. I want them to make their allegiance to the natural world. And then however, however that leads them to act, um, I mean, that's, they need to figure out what that means. Has the sort of first tier worked in terms of how the environmental movement is deploying postcards? I'm not sure what you're asking. Has the um, has has sort of the vehemently peaceful um, way to make change actually worked at this point? Well, the the whatever we're doing is not currently working because the world's still getting killed. You could say it is working because slightly less of it's getting killed than would have been getting killed otherwise. So. That's better than nothing, and I am not diminishing that at all. But it's, as the logicians say, it's necessary but not sufficient. Things won't be sufficient until, I mean, what I want is very simple. What I want is for there to be a world with more wild salmon every year than the year before, more migratory songbirds every year than the year before, more soil every year than the year before, healthier soil than every year than the year before, less dioxin every mother's breast milk every year than the year before, and I'll do whatever it takes to get there. That's, that's the, the only measure by which we'll be judged by those who come after is going to be whether they can breathe the air and drink the water and whether the land will support them or the ocean will support them. That's the only measure by which we're gonna be judged. Not gonna care about anything else. Not gonna care how hard we tried. Not gonna care we wrote a bunch of really big books. Not gonna care about any of that. What they care about is, is whether the land will support them. And that's the only measure that, that I, on the deepest level, it's the only measure I really care about. And right now, um, we're not we're not protecting that for, for for people in the future, essentially. And no, no, people a hundred years from now, if there's anybody left, Lear Keith always says this, and it's very true. If there's anybody left a hundred years from now, they're going to wonder what the fuck was wrong with us that we didn't fight like hell when the world was going down. You know, we can look back. My heroes in World War II are members of the resistance. And we can look back and say, God, that would have been me. But would it? Would it? And you know, it is really an honor and a joy, despite the horror and the sorrow, to live at this time because Because we're really the last, the last, the last chance. This is, this is, you know, it's hard to say. It's so funny that people, if you say that this is the end time, a lot of people will say, oh gosh, they've been saying that for thousands of years. And, you know, they, they thought that, that revelation was just around the corner. Um, the difference is that, uh, we are in the midst of an environmental apocalypse. And and it's pretty horrifying, but also what an opportunity. What an opportunity to do the right thing. That's the thing too, as the system becomes more centralized, it becomes more vulnerable. That it's extraordinary that a virus in China can shut down the economy all the way across the world. Huh. So what does that mean when a disruption in one place 
can affect everywhere else. And the question becomes, how do we, how do those of us who care about the living planet use that understanding to inform our defense of the planet? I want to be really, really clear. I am not the, uh, the violence guy. I'm not, in no way am I ever going to say that militant resistance is the only solution because I don't believe it. I believe, and I've always believed this, that we need it all. We need people working to restore rivers. We need people filing lawsuits. We need people doing education. We need people making films. The problem is, as I've said, those are necessary but not sufficient. You know, when people ask, how can, how can we help the salmon survive? Or what will it take for the salmon to survive? They're not really being honest. Because what they're really asking is, what will it take for salmon to survive without stopping deforestation, without removing dams, without stopping the murder of the oceans, without stopping global warming, without stopping industrial fishing? And the answer is you can't. So if you want salmon to survive, what you need to do is stop industrial logging, stop industrial fishing, remove dams, stop the murder of the oceans, and stop global warming. If you want to stop uh, global warming, how can we stop global warming without stopping the economy, industrial economy? You can't. Industrial economy, it's not just the industrial economy, it's the agricultural economy. Global warming did not start with fossil fuels. It was already well underway. Um, it really started with rice farming. It started a long time ago. It started with the advent of agriculture. Um, and yeah, that's daunting. It's daunting to bring down civilization. It's scary. But you know what's even more scary? Not doing it. What's even more scary is killing the planet. Just so to finish, what would you frame our choice as right now? Many people have said, you know, we have renewables or, you know, climate change. What would you say our choice is? I would say our choice is not renewables or climate change because Renewables, for Jevons' paradox and for all sorts of other reasons, don't actually help the planet. I would say our choice is between continuing this way of life, continuing infinite growth, continuing industrial civilization, continuing civilization, and allowing life on the planet to continue. The good news is that we don't actually have to do that much repair work. What we have to do is stop the primary harm and at least currently, the planet still knows how to, no, the planet will always know how to repair, heal, whether the planet will have been pushed beyond the point at which it cannot is another question. But, I mean, it's too late for passenger pigeons, and it's too late for the chestnut trees who relied on pass passenger pigeons, probably. It's not yet too late for salmon. Another 20 years, another 10 years, maybe. Um, it is extraordinary how much carbon can be sequestered by grasslands, by salt marshes, by mangrove swamps, by forests, by kelp beds, seagrass. The positive thing is that life wants to live, and life will fight so desperately hard to live. And all we need to do is align ourselves with that and join the fight. Is there anything else you want to say? No, I think that's good. Yeah, that was really 